for Mother's Day. Last night. <laughs> I got one a little buddy. But I got me and Eddie can't figure it all out and, and Brad can't figure all the words out yet. <laughs>
first thing the Lord touched uh, Francis, Lord, her body, and as she touched Angie, touched her body. Yeah. Lord, many people were that are sick, and they're just represented by raising the hand. That's you right now. Lord, bless them and to anoint them. God, show yourself strong, show yourself powerful in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for all that you do for us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Y'all ready for Mother's Day song? Mother's Day song. Okay. Now, y'all got to watch it good now because I don't see it. It's so simple that it's complicated. Okay, y'all ready? This, this, no. Ready? Here we go. <laughs> okay? So it's not a new song. It's just three words. So you got to think about it. It's, it's, normally, I keep falling in love with him over and over. But now I keep thanking God for her over and over. So you got to look at the words. Because I'm up here singing and still want to sing it the other way. So, ready? We'll turn on. We'll turn on. We're really going here.
Bill he wrote with that for her, and it's, it's just a yeah. little something to remind her that it's Mother's Day. Yeah. And I also had a little something that I wanted to read. Um, I don't know, in, in years past, or, and I'm sure you've heard other people say it too, I always say that the, the first voice and touch from Mama was your first glimpse of God. Well, a couple years ago, I went across this letter, and it, it's something I like, so I thought maybe I would share it with you today. It says, Dear Mom, I see Jesus in you. When you sang to me, when you sang me to sleep night after night, when you made me grilled cheese for years straight without complaining, when you came along to field trips just to be with me, I saw Jesus in you. When you made my favorite birthday dinners, when you hosted and called all my friends to church, when you were the first to say I'm sorry, I saw Jesus in you. When you left a card in my car to tell me that I'm loved, when you broke my back and caught my teenage tears, when you saw a stranger's need and showed me how to do it, I saw Jesus in you. When you let, you, when you let my needs come before your dreams, <laughs> when you let my needs come before your dreams, when you showed me how to receive grace, when you loved Dad and others well, I saw Jesus in you. When you were mistreated, when you were mistreated and chose forgiveness, when you pushed away comfort to comfort others, when life went sideways and you still laughed, I saw Jesus in you. When you wrestled with deep pain and continued choosing God, when others got what you want and you poured blessings on them, when you showed me how to hope despite great disappointment, I saw Jesus in you. Mom, I know you'll tell me you fell short. You'll tell me what things you want me to do differently. You'll tell me what you would change. And I'll tell you that you're in perfection. Only taught me more about Jesus. Mom, I see Jesus in you. Amen. 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 God is so awesome. Guys, how many of you already got your wife a Mother's Day gift? Okay. How many haven't got it yet? Alright. Well, I'm going to give you some information. I'm going to give you some clues of what to do and what not to do. Okay? Uh... I gave my wife a, a, a shirt from our dog that says, Mama, I love you. That said, You're my mom, I love you, Mom. And said, If another woman tried to take me, I would bite him on the butt and come back running to you, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had a picture to put up here of it. Uh, and instead, and, and was, I'm going to tell you, that was a good gift, okay? But this here was, I'm going to tell you what, not. I didn't put it up here, you got this. Uh, what not to buy. So listen to me. Although the only, per only person a man usually shops for is his wife, the whole experience is a stressful one. Amen? Yeah. Many a man has felt extreme frigid temperatures for long periods based on a poor president decision. <laughs> As a veteran of these wars, I'm still not sure what to buy my wife, but I'll pass on what not to buy. Number one, don't buy her anything that plugs in. Anything that requires electricity is seen as a utilitarian. <laughs> don't, buy, don't buy clothing that involves sizes. The chances, listen carefully, the chances are one in 7,000 that you will get her the right size. And your wife will be offended for the other 6,999 times. I've heard this, do I look like a size 16? Or two smalls, two small sizes don't cut either. I haven't worn this size in 20 years. Don't buy clothes that require sizes. Number three, avoid things that are useful. <laughs> <laughs> the new silver polish advertises that hundreds of hours is not going to win you any brownie points. Neither is a new fishing pole or a weed eater. Number four, don't buy anything that involves a weight loss or self-improvement. 
<laughs> She'll proceed with six foot membership to a diet center as a suggestion that she's back. Number five, don't buy her jewelry. The jewelry you buy what you can't afford, and the jewelry that you can't afford, she don't want. <laughs> I had a guy one time told me, he said, I like this, and he showed me, he showed me that. I thought, that's a nice diamond ring you bought for your wife. He says, that's not real diamond. He says, that's a fake diamond. I said, but I thought she wanted the cheap. He said, where can I find a fake cheap? <laughs> Number six. And guys, do not fall into the traditional trap of buying her frilly underwear. Your idea of the kind your wife should wear and what she actually wears are light years apart. <laughs> and finally, don't spend too much. How do you think we're going to afford that, she'll ask. <coughs> or, but don't spend too little, because then she won't say anything, but she'll think, is that all I'm worth? So honestly, I'm not sure what to give her, but you've been armed by not to get her. Amen. God is so awesome. Amen. So now, this is crazy. Not crazy, it's awesome how God works. You know, we're going to go back into the book of Ruth today. Because we started a couple weeks ago. And as I was getting into it, looking at it, all of a sudden the Lord took me into another area of Ruth. And so this is not about her and Boaz and the kids from Deborah, that'll be next week. This here is about handfuls of purpose. Okay, so you bear with me. Bear with me while, we're, while, while we read this. So, so what I want to do is I want everybody to stand. You can just read it right up here. It'll be all right. Or you can get your, get your Bible out. But, but we're going to turn uh, to the book of Ruth, chapter 2, verses 8 through 16. And again, you can turn to it or you can look at it up here. But everybody stand. And we're going to read this. Okay? Did y'all see it? I made it kind of small. Thanks for making it small. <laughs> I didn't realize it was that small. Whoa! Get your Bible out. <laughs> ah. yeah, get, yeah, get your Bible out. And turn to, turn to Ruth. Uh. <laughs> yeah, it was a little on the small side. Amen. <laughs> God is so, so awesome. Come on, come on. Fine, go, go to Genesis and turn right. All right, Ruth chapter 2. <laughs> that is really small. That should have been two slides. That would have been better. Okay. Well, you know, hindsight is better than nearsight. Are <laughs> you ready? Chapter, chapter 2, verse 8. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go to do from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let the eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not Touch them shall not touch them, that I'm protecting you. And when thou art a thirst, go into the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said, Why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing that I'm a stranger? <clears throat> and Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been shown to me all that thou hast done unto thy mother in law since the death of thine husband. And how thou hast left thy, thy father and thy mother in the land of the, thy nativity, and art come unto the people which thou knowest not heretofore. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, on whose wings that thou art come to trust. Then she said, Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for thou hast comforted me, for thou hast spoken uh, friendly unto me, thy handmaid, therefore, though I be not like one of thy handmaids. This is a foreigner. You got to understand. She she is a Jews had nothing to do with her. Okay, and Boaz said unto her, At mealtime come up thither and eat of the bread and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers and he and he reached her parched corn and and she did eat and was sufficed and left for she was full. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded the young men saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves. 
and reproach her not. In other words, just don't she don't need to just get them off the ground. If she wants to get it anywhere up there on, on, the, on those that wheat, she can get it or that grain. Here it is. And then follow also some of the handfuls of purpose for her and leave them that she may glean them and rebuke her not. Stretch forth your hands and say, Father, I love you, Lord. I praise your name. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you, God, for this day. I thank you for this time, this hour. I thank you for our mothers, Lord. I thank you, God, for how awesome they are. And they're very much underrated and underappreciated for all the stuff they do and have done over the years. I ask you right now, Lord, to bless them today. And Father, help them find some, some encouragement today in the name of Jesus. We thank you for it all. In the name of Jesus, we pray. The church head. Amen. Amen. Now tell somebody to pass it behind us. The future is ahead of us. God is with us. And nothing, and nothing, and nothing shall be impossible. Give Lord a hand clap of praise. All right, all right, all right. Now, everything else will be a little bit bigger for you. Handfuls on purpose. Of course, there's two hands there. There's two different colors. Meaning, here's God, and here's us. Okay? I want you to, want you just to let, me, let me just talk to you for a few minutes now. Handfuls of purpose. What is that anyway? What, what, what does that show? What does that tell? Well, you know, God was getting ready to teach Ruth a very valuable lesson. About to teach her a great principle. About to give her hope that she could not believe. And at the same time, not only is it going to help Ruth, but also it's going to help every mother in here today. Okay? And here, here, here is the lesson. You do what you can do. Trust God to do what you can do. If I got a hard-headed young man, don't raise your hand. <laughs> Anybody here got a hard-headed husband, ladies? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> I saw one raise your hand. I thought it was the head hurt. Okay. Now here's the God, I believe with all my heart, is showing you today. That when you've done what you can do, you'll fill in the gaps. Not just mothers, women in general. Because you're a woman, I promise you, you're, you are a mother to somebody. There's somebody that's looking to you in a motherly way. You're, you may not, they may not call you mother, but they see you in such a way that you do represent a mother to them. And so, so you do what you can do. And trust God to do what you can do. He will. Don't say he'll fill in the gaps. All right. So now, oh, there you go. Anybody ever been there? Post a note, post a note, post a note, post a note. Amen. Ready? Hey, mothers. <laughs> I'm asking a few questions. Ready? Have you ever felt overwhelmed by life's challenges? Have you ever felt like you were in the wrong place at the wrong time? Have you ever felt like you had the wrong connections? Have you ever felt like you had the wrong background? Get ready to get we get ready to get happy in a minute, okay? I promise you. Your life questions are crowded with what ifs and should have could have woulds. <clears throat> Why do you have to look through the future? Should have, could have, would have looked through the past. And so you're looking back at the past. I should have, could have, would have. I wish I'd have done this. I wish I'd have done that. Man, my kids would be in trouble right now if I'd have done this. Or my kids would be at a different point in their life if I'd have just done this. Or my husband and I, we'd be getting on a whole lot better. If just should have, could have, would have. Or what if my kid winds up getting arrested? Or what if my kid winds up uh, striking at me? Or what if, what if, what if? So these are questions that every mother, every woman in this place faces daily. So with these, with these questions, I'm here to tell you, we got Ruth here. God's going to take Ruth and God's going to show us, well, listen, God's going to show us with Ruth. I love this. Well, I love this. God is writing your story. Listen carefully. Don't you know that God's writing your story and all the stuff that's good, bad, or ugly? God is writing your story. Do you trust Him enough 
to let go of the pen. Whoa. Think about it. Everything that you're going through right now, everything you've seen, everything you know, everything in the past, present, and future, God is writing your story. Do you trust Him enough to let go of the pen and let Him write? Wow. So, Ruth shows us, hold on, there's always hope. God is listen, He's still on the throne. He's still working. He's still able to meet your needs. So again, I'm going to say it, that very loudly, take the pen out of your hand and place it in God's. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's what Ruth did when she followed Naomi back to Bethlehem. She took the pen out of her hand and she put it in God's hand and you're going to see some awesome stuff that happened. So y'all want to hear today, if you can learn to let it go, to not have so much control, if you can just let go of the pen and give it to God, some amazing things would happen today. Amen? There's one thing, if you've been through trauma or you've been through hurt, a lot of times you, you can't find it easy to let go of the pen because you got to have that control. But I'm here to tell you, you've got to learn to let go, give the pen to God, let go and let God. So we're going to talk about for just a, just a few minutes. I promise you, just a few minutes. We're going to we're going to talk about lessons from Luke, Luke, and from Ruth, and encouragement to all of us. And we're going to have a different version now, so so to make it more down to earth, we can understand, you know. But here, let's let's talk about this. Very first thing she learned is don't let your past define you. How many times are you going to do something for your kids, do something for your husband, do something at work, or do something whatever, you're thinking, well, I can't do that because look where I come from. I don't have the right last name. I, I was born on the wrong side of the tracks. I'm just not the right kind. I, I don't think I can do this. Not realizing, again, you're taking the pen from God, from His hand, and you're putting it in your own hand. Alright? So look, let's, 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 let's just watch Ruth. We're going to see this from Ruth here. First, she had a real start. The Bible says uh, in Ruth chapter 1, let's go ahead and, and read this first few verses. Uh, well, once upon a time, it was back in the days when the judges led Israel. There was a famine in the land. A man from Bethlehem in Judah left home to live in the country of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons. The man's name was Elimelech and his wife's name was Naomi. His sons were named Milan and Gilead, all Ephraimites from Bethlehem and Judah. They all went to the country of Moab and settled there. Elimelech died, and the only was left, she and her two sons. They took Moabite wives. Y'all say Moabite. Moabite. All right, just hold on there. The name of the first was over and the second Ruth. They lived there in Moab for the next 10 years. But then the two brothers, uh, Milan and Gilead, died. Now the women, woman was left there without either her young men or her husband. Very first thing, right smack in the face. She's a Moabite. Moabites were detested by Israel, they were detested by godly Jews because the Moabites came from an incestuous, incestuous relationship with Lot and his oldest daughter. When they ran out of the city, and he said, Lot, he took the pen out of God's hand and put it in his own. And he said, well, We got to have some kids. And so, or the words daughters, excuse me, his daughters said, We got to have some kids. And so they get their daddy drunk, and then they wind up having sex with their daddy. And that's how the Moabites came into existence with the oldest daughter, because she took the pen out of God's hand and put it in her own hand. And so the Moabites were born. And so the Moabites, they did not worship God like we do, they didn't worship God like Israel did. Uh, the Moabites were a pagan nation. They worship and sacrifice to idols. So they were not, they were not on Israel's good list. So first, she had a rough start. She was a Moabite. Secondly, who came? She got a chance to marry a godly man. Hey, if she was in Moab and and, uh, and she would marry another Moabite, 
then that would not be a godly man. So the godly man came to her. And got down, down. There's all kinds of ways to take this and play this out. But just remember this. No matter where you're at in your life, if you'll take it, again, I keep saying, if you take the pen out of your hand and put it in God's, God can bring to you what you need no matter where you're at. So God brings Ruth a husband. And so here comes some hope. But then her hope snatched away. Her husband died. <laughs> and that's the question. How many times, moms? How many times, ladies? How many times, men? Have you seen God move in such a way you know it was God? Because you weren't even looking for it, and God helped you. God blessed you. And while God blessed you, you're feeling the blessing, and then you feel hope, and then the hope is snatched away. Not taken, snatched away. See, she didn't know that this was all part of God's plan. If we can get in our minds that God has a plan and that God uses everything, good, bad, and ugly in our lives to complete his plan, it's amazing what would happen. So, so she did their past to find her. Number one, just a few things. I love this. See a little boy there with his teddy bear and his knapsack? Sometimes you face difficulties not because you're doing something wrong, but because you're doing something right. Wow. That's powerful. Number two. Don't let your present difficulties, or let do let your present difficulties develop you. When God allows you to go through things, it is because He is working something new in you. God is doing something. He's building you. He's, he's actually, believe it or not, encouraging you in a way that you might not want to encourage yourself. But he's there. So what? Now, here she was. She was in a bad place. Let's see if we read a little bit more. After a short while on the road, Naomi said, we're going back. There's nothing here we're going back. So in a short time on the road, Naomi told her daughter laws you go back home. Go back home and live with your mothers. And may God treat you as graciously as you have, you have treated your deceased husbands and me. May God give each of you a new home and a new husband. So she kissed them and she cried openly. She's in a bad spot. I don't know exactly because it doesn't say, but I'm pretty sure for a Moabite woman to marry a godly man, she weren't scoring any points with the Moabites. There was no kiss of Redeemer because the Redeemer says, if we wait around for us to have another son, so you get a kiss of Redeemer, you'll be too old, but he'll be this little fella. No, no, no. You stay here in this bad place. And I'm going to go get back and connect with God. So, she's in a bad place. But she chose not to stay there. Verse 14. Let me just go to verse 10 through 15. That'll, that'll just go to cover a lot right there. They said, no, we're going on with you to your people. But Naomi was firm. Go back, my daughters. Why would you come to me? Do you suppose I have sons in my womb who can become your future husbands? Go back, dear daughters. On your way, please. Am I too old to, to get a husband? Why, even if I said... There shall be hope this very night I've uh, got a man and has sons. Can you imagine uh, being satisfied with waiting until they're grown? Would you wait that long to get married again? No, dear daughters, this is a bitter pill for me to swallow. More bitter than, than for you, God has dealt me a hard blow. And again they cried openly, Orpha kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. She was a kisser. Everybody in life is going to have kissers that come along when things get tough. They... But Ruth was a cleaner. Things got tough. She held on. So watch. So, Luther kissed her mother in law goodbye, but Ruth embraced her and held on. Then we said, Look, your sister in law is going back to live with her own people and God. Or their gods. Go be with her. She chose. 
not stay there. Some of y'all right now, there's things going on in your life, there's things happening with you, your kids, your husband, your family, your in-laws, your outlaws, all of them, and, and, and Satan will have you think that it's always going to be this way, it's always going to be bad, there's no hope, blah, 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 it's just, just bad, 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 just to get you so discouraged that you won't trust God, that you'll take the pen out of God's hand and put it back in yours. She didn't do that. Matter of fact, I love this. I do this in just about every wedding that I do. Ruth said, Do not force me to leave you. Or don't let me go home. Where you go, I will go. Where you live, I will live. Your people shall be my people, your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And that's where I'll be buried. So help me, God. Not even death itself is going to come between us. Wow. That's a clean one. That's the person you want by your side when you go into a rough spot. But that person right there is not going to let you down. They're not going to leave you. The kiss her. Okay, things look rough. Bye. The cleaner he is, not even death. Ain't coming between us. So now, so now, watch this. I'm, getting, I'm moving on. I'm trying to keep this going quick. All right. I know y'all got to take your mama out. If you take us to McDonald's, we got to beat the badges. <laughs> All right, ready? To the mom who is feeling defeated, you're not alone. Get ready. Number three. Number one was, I don't just pass the fine. Number two was, do let your present difficulties develop you. God knows what you're going through. He didn't just wake up. Whoa, I didn't know that was going to happen. All right. Number three. Don't be discouraged. Listen carefully. Don't be discouraged. If your fresh beginnings are so fresh. I'm going to start reading some more. Ruth chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. And so it happened that Naomi had a relative by marriage, a man prominent and rich, connected with the Limelech's family. His name was Boaz. One day Ruth, the Moabite partner, said to Naomi, I'm going to work and I'm going out to glean among the sheep, following out some harvesters who will treat me kindly. Naomi said, Go ahead, dear daughter. So here she is. Now remember, cleaning the fields back in that day was the welfare system. It's not that like she's going to work with a farmer and she's going to be driving a tractor. And, no, no, no. What the gleaners did was after the, after the field was harvested, they would go through and they were straightened by God to let some things, you know, to, to pick it up. If you drop something, you've got to pick it up because. The welfare system was people would come behind and they would walk through the field and things that were dropped, they would pick up. And that would be the, the welfare system of that day. And so here we have a fresh beginning, but it's not so fresh. Because now she goes to Bethlehem and now she's the only one that can do anything about the what they're in and she has no skills, she has nothing. So she winds up doing the most common form of labor there is. So don't, just, don't get discouraged if your fresh beginnings aren't so fresh. And don't get discouraged if your new beginnings take time. Let's read a little bit more. And so she set out. She went and started gleaning in the field, following in the wake of the harvesters. Eventually she ended up in the part of the field owned by Boaz, her father-in-law's uh, her father in law Emily's relative. A little later, Boaz came out, uh, came out from Bethlehem, greeting her as harvesters. God be with you. They replied, and God bless you. Boaz asked the young servant who was a foreman over the farmhands, Who is this woman? Where'd she come from? The King James says it just happened that she winds up in Boaz's field. Oh God, when you take the pen, out of your hand and give it to God. It's amazing what would happen. And so here she goes. Just take the time. Still, she's harvested. She's in the welfare system. Things are not looking good, but she's clung to her mother-in-law and she has made a commitment that I'm going to be here and she's doing what she can do. So not only don't be discouraged if your fresh beginnings are so fresh, if it takes time, 
but also it takes trust. Let me read this. The woman said, why, that's the Moabite girl, the one who came with Adam from the country of Moab. She asked permission to let me glean, she said, and gather among the sheaves, following after your harvesters. She's been at it steady ever since, from early morning to now, without so much as a break. Then Moab spake to Ruth, listen, my daughter, from now on don't go into any other field to glean. Stay right here in this one. See, 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 God's, God's pen, God's writing. And stay close to my young women. Watch where they are harvesting and follow them. And don't worry about a thing. I've given orders to my servants not to harass you. When you get thirsty, feel free to go and drink water from the water buckets that the servants have filled. She dropped her knees and then bowed her face to the ground. How does this happen that you should pick me out and treat me so kindly? Me, a foreigner. Though as answered her, I've heard all about you. I heard about the way you treated your mother-in-law out of the death of her husband and how you met your father and your mother in the land of your birth and you have come to live with a bunch of total strangers. God rewards you well for what you have done and with a generous bonus besides from God to whom you have come seeking protection under his wings. She said, Oh, sir, such grace, such kindness, I don't deserve it. You've touched my heart. You treated me like one of your own and I don't even belong here. After love's great, Boaz said unto her, Go over here and eat some bread and dip it in the wine. So she joined the harvesters. Boaz passed a toast of grain to her. She ate herself full and even had some left over. When she got back to go to work, Boaz ordered the servants to let her clean, for there's plenty of grain on the ground, make it easy for her. Better yet, pull some of the good stuff out and leave it for her to glean handfuls of grass. Give her special treatment. Ruth leaned in the field every until evening, and when she had threshed out of what she had gathered, she ended up with nearly a full sack of barley. She gathered up her leftovers from lunch, and then may ask her, Where did you glean today? Who's field? God bless whoever it was who took such good care of you. Ruth told her mother in law, The man to whom I work today, his name is Boaz. Then we said to her daughter in law, Why, God bless that man. God hasn't quite walked out on us after all. Woo! Some of y'all need to hear that right now. He ain't walking out. He's got you. He's holding you. He got it. He knows every move you've made. He knows the time that you did it with his direction. He knows the time you did it on your own direction. He even knows it right now. If he's talking to you and you're not listening. <laughs> <laughs> he still loves us in bad times as well as good. And then we know that man. Ruth is one of our circle of covenant redeemers, a close relative of ours. Now remember, Boaz is not number one. You've got to be the closest relative. At this point, Boaz is not number one. Y'all say that. Boaz is not number one. Okay. So now, now, let's look over here. Uh, this is this is something. Um, I just want to, I just got to stop here. Go to chapter three. We're looking at chapter 3. There was a close relative. There was a close relative. And to be the kids of redeemer, we'll talk about it next week. I don't want to get too much into it. But you know, you had to have a price to pay. You had to be willing to pay it. You had to pay it all. He had to complete the total task and he had to be free himself. And so, there was a relative that was able to do all that. He was legal, kinsman, Redeemer. But the legal kids of Redeemer didn't want a Redeemer. Why? She was a Moabite. He would buy the land back, but part of the conditions to finish the whole work, he had to marry her. And provide or get fruit from this marriage, have children that could be heirs. And so the Man said, I, I, I don't want, I, I'm not going to do this because I don't want a Moabitess heir. I'll warn my family if I do this. And we all know the story, maybe you don't, where he goes and stands before the city council and men at the gate, and Boaz says, well, he'll do it. And so, in order to do it, the other guy, 
He said, are you willing to be the redeemer? He said, no. He said, I'm going to improve it. And he gave Boaz his shoe. What does that mean? That means I give up all rights to walk in that land. I give up all rights to anything that belongs to my next of kin. I'm giving you the rights to do this, Boaz. And so he did that. Now look, God's got plans for you. Did you know that? Let me put my shoe back on. It's not supposed to play up here. Y'all notice that? Oh, my shoe. Okay. God has plans for you. It says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a future and a hope. It does not mean that everything's going to be hunky dory, everything's going to fall into place, you'll never be sick, you'll never be up against difficulties, you'll never experience trauma. What it means is, He plans for all that does happen to you, you're still going to move forward. It's not going to stop you, it's going to prosper you. God's going to take the pain, the trauma, whatever. And he's going to use it to develop you and to give you a future and a hope. So let's watch this. Let's go a little bit further. So just about through now. Don't let your past define you. Don't let your, do let your present difficulties develop you. Don't get discouraged if it's your fresh beginnings, even if legal, legal kinsmen. A little bit of hope she had was taken away again. Do trust God in the process. God sent her Boaz. Boaz from deep get. God put it in his heart. It was powerful. As a matter of fact, God actually brought the right one. At the right time. They get married. And the wildest thing. One morning she's gleaning leftovers in the field. And that night she owns the field. Wow. I, I can't say that enough. One day she's gleaning drops specks in the field and then 20, within 24 hours she owns the field. Now, now, now let's just go a little bit further here. Not that her break come, but her baby came. Now you got this, this right here so far. This, this blows me away. I'm going to get ready to show you we'll leave right into next week. Let's just look at this a little bit differently. Her hope lasts beyond her. Watch this. I love this. This is the message version. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. Plans to take care of you, not abandon you. Plans to give you the future that you hope for. Let's go back to what we just talked about. You read close. I said, get ready. That don't mean anything. Don't get, don't get encouraged by that. Not yet. Let's do some genealogy. Let's start with Boaz's day. Okay, you tell a lot about a guy by day. Sam. Sam. Sam when we got Boaz. You know who Sam's wife was? Rahab the harlot. Wow. Rahab the harlot, another person nobody wanted to be around. She's from Jericho. It's a cursed city. She's a harlot. And one of the spies was Simon. Simon is a spy in the city, goes in to, to check out the city and come back and tell Joshua what's going on. Rahab saves their lives. 
He develops a relationship with Rahab and marries her. Then Boaz comes along. Now Boaz, unlike the other legal kids of redeemer, the legal kids of redeemer did not want to mar his inheritance because he was holy. I've seen people, they walk around, and I hear, I can hear this in my head. They might not be seeing it, but I'm hearing it. Watch this. Holy, 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 don't touch me before I break. They think they're too good for anybody. They're too holy. That kind of holy is spelled H-O-L-E. <coughs> Go to the attention center with us at one time. You'll drop that holy stuff. I promise. Especially when you walk through the urn, or you see people that's got feces on their face and they're looking like they're brave heart. Yeah. Or some of the stuff we get to hear all the time. And then, wherever else I'm doing stuff, you get to see and get to hear things you're going, what? So you better trust God. But at the same time, don't think you're so holy. Because, number one, we all need a Savior. Number two, we're all at the same level at the foot of the cross. All of us. So, the legal kids wouldn't have anything to do with her. He's a chip off the old block. Go ahead and say this. Look, my mama, my mama, she's right now. I know my mom's past. She's not defined by her past. She was a harlot. Not only was she was a harlot, but she was in Jericho. She is not an Israelite. And my daddy can step over, take the pen out of his hand and give it to God. And my mom was Rahab. Then I can take a Moabitess, Ruth. Wow. So Ruth and Boaz we get Obed. Obed we get Jesse. Not that one back there either. Not Jesse White. Although it is a good name, Jesse. Jesse begins David, the king of Israel, the giant slayer. Whoa. This is the line of Jesus. Because look, what do they call Jesus? The son of David. If you look in the begots in Matthew, and you get a look and you'll find out that in the line of Jesus, it's all men. Except for those two spots where there's women. One is Rahab and one is Ruth. God took Harlot from a from a city that was pagan. God took a woman whose ancestry come from a, a an incestuous relationship with Lot's daughter and Lot. And he put them in the line of his son. Wow. That's powerful. You can't get much more powerful than that. So, today, he showed Bruce something very special, but he didn't show it tomorrow all the time. Because not only did Boaz give her handfuls on purpose, Boaz was prophetical. Because what was actually going on when Boaz prophesied about the handfuls on purpose is what God had done in her life all the way through. Watch it. I love it. 
God did not give her all at once. But he gave her handfuls on purpose. Handful by handful. In my own life, been very colorful, <laughs> been crazy at times. And God didn't just do it all at one time. He gave me handful by handful by handful by handful by handful. Some of y'all here right now. <coughs> Don't give in. Don't give up. There's a handful on the way. <laughs> Watch what God will do with your children. What He'll do with your marriage. What He'll do with your family. What He'll do with your life. On your job. Handful by handful by handful. Trust God. He knows what he's doing. Randy, come on over, brother. I'm going to give you a challenge today. Instead of being tore up about how the story is being written, I want you to check your hand. Do I keep putting this being in my hand? Do I have to have control? If it doesn't go my way, God's not working. If things will happen exactly like I expect them to happen, is God not paying attention? Or can I just take the pen and say, here you go. You're right, God. I don't understand it all. Doesn't make sense. It's all happening at one time. But I've seen you year after year after year after year drop handfuls for me. <clears throat> you can have the pen. I can't control it. I can't control everybody else around me. I can't control circumstances. The only thing I can control is it. Everybody stay.
If you're here today and you don't know Jesus or you would like to get closer to Jesus, but nobody looking around, every eye closed, would you just slip your hand up and say, either I don't know him or I want to get closer, would you raise that hand? Maybe you're here this morning. <coughs>